Hello everyone and welcome back to Strategy Gaming Dojo where we find, learn, and play the great strategy games. Today we are continuing on with our basic tutorial for Gary Grigsby's War in the Pacific Admirals Edition. This is episode number five. In this episode we're going to start talking about logistics. Uh, we're going to understand fuel and supplies which are the two big items of logistics that you need to worry about as a beginning player and really as an allied player overall. It's just those two things and moving them from where they are to where they need to be. Now in the first four episodes, in episode one we talked about options and preferences, how to set up the game to play it the way you want. In episode number two we talked about the map and what you see on the map and what it means. In episode number three we talked about these informational buttons here at the top and the various databases uh, that you can use to find what you're looking for and where it is. Um, in episode number four we talked about the bases and how important bases are. They will also be very important to logistics. Bases are where you pick up supplies and fuel and where you drop off supplies and fuel. So as with everything in this game, it all revolves around the bases. So let's jump into logistics. <clears throat> now, as I said, there are really only two things as a beginning player with logistics that you need to worry about. And that are the kind of finished products of fuel and supplies. Now there are three raw materials, manpower, oil and resources but again as a beginning player and an allied player you don't really need to worry about those uh, they will automatically be going to your uh, refineries when it comes to oil being turned into fuel uh, or go to your factories when it comes to resources and oil being turned into supplies it's like a witch's brew it's like 10 parts of this and two parts of that and it spits out a supply point um, or a fuel point. So fuel fuels your Navy. Uh, you need fuel to get your ships moving and moving around. Uh, supplies, they supply your ground units and your air wings. So supply and fuel, it's really that simple. So I know a lot of people get, um, you know, a little intimidated by the logistics of this game. And, you know, setting up the convoys and getting them where you want them to be is can be laborious. I mean, it takes some time to set those all up, but you're really only dealing with two finished products. Uh, so therefore, you know, it's not as difficult as it may seem. Now, speaking of those products, so I flipped this over here to Los Angeles because Los Angeles is a good example of what I'm talking about. So Los Angeles has already has, this is on day one, December 8th, 603,000 units of fuel. Now a ship, you know, may only take about 100 units a day to operate. So this is a massive amount of fuel. Supply, it's already got 74,000 supply units. Uh, you know, a ground unit may only take 100 supply units a day to be at peak condition. So that's why supply is important. You want your ground units to be uh, operating at peak efficiency. You want your air units to be operating at peak efficiency. So you want them to be what we call quote unquote in supply. You want to have supplies there that, that, they, that they can use. If they're not in supply, and as we get into the ground units and the air wings, you'll know that because you'll get a red indicator for supply. Um, if they're not in supply, they will have various um, penalties in their combat or how they operate or how many planes can get up in the ground. So that's why it's important. You need to have that stuff there so that your army, your war machine is operating at peak efficiency. Let's jump up here to San Francisco really fast. Uh, again, San Francisco's already got 86,000 in supply, uh, 176,000 in fuel. That will even build from there. It will also build from there at Los Angeles. San Diego's a little smaller, but as you can see, it's already got 269,000 in fuel. 
though that happens naturally already that's an advantage that you have as the allied player you don't have to go set up factories yourself or you know say i got to move this refinery over here none of that is important you're really just moving what the big us uh, production is already creating again if we move up here to the eastern usa you know stand in port for the entire eastern usa it's already got 100,000 supplies, 87,000 in fuel. So the challenge then is getting all of this supply <clears throat> and all of this fuel where you need it to, to be. And we're going to be doing that with cargo ships. Cargo ships and tankers. Tankers generally are going to be moving your fuel. Cargo ships are generally going to be moving your supplies. Um, they can move fuel, uh, cargo ships can, they can move liquid, but at a half rate. So if their cargo capacity, and let's, let's go down here to LA and pull up a cargo ship. Well, first of all, let's pull up a tanker. Here are tankers uh, we see here. So let's look at the California standard. The car California standard has a capacity of 9,430. What does that mean? When we dock it and load it up, it can take 9,430 of these fuel points onto its onto onto the ship and move that. Um, that's its that's its cargo or its liquid capacity. And if we click on it here, you'll see down here in the right hand side, uh, fuel and oil capacity. 9,430. So if we dock that here, um, we turn it into a task force, we dock it, it will load 9,430 units of fuel and we can get that moving. Uh, let's look at a cargo ship. A uh, cargo ship is an AK. These are all cargo ships. The little X in front of that just means it's a civilian cargo ship. Just don't even worry about that. You know, whether it's civilian or it's actually a commission ship of the military really doesn't matter <clears throat> for our basic purposes here. So here you'll see we have a cargo ship, troop capacity, it cannot carry any troops. And then you see cargo capacity, 3,200. That means it can load 3,200 units of this supply. So you'll turn it into a task force, dock it, have it load supplies and it will load up to 3200. Now cargo ships can also move fuel, but they do it at a half rate, meaning if the cargo capacity of that cargo ship we just saw is 3200, it can only move 1600 if it's moving fuel. So again, two things, supply and fuel. Um, let's look at the grand strategic map and talk about the big nodes and our logistics lines that we're going to be creating. So for that, I'm going to pull out the arrows here. Now, as the allied player, you've got Canada, the Canadian kind of stand in here. Um, well, hold on. Let me get rid of that for a second. That wasn't a very nice line there. You've got Canada. That's going to be moving down the transcontinental railroad out to these Canadian cities. Uh, that happens naturally. Now, that's one thing I'll say. Over land, it's not as if you were going to be setting up convoys of trucks uh, to move these things over land. They move over the railways. They move over the roads. Um, any places that connect can be... Uh, I guess you can trace a supply line is the best way to put it. Things will naturally move. You don't have to do that. Uh, that happens automatically. So when we bring supply into a major port, that will also happen automatically through the countryside. It will filter all of that supply or that fuel through the countryside as well. So over land that happens naturally. So anyway, let's talk about these big nodes. Canada, You've got the eastern U.S. that we will either that will either come down by railway here to the west coast and appear naturally, or we will be loading it on ships and taking it through the Panama Canal. 
So from the Panama Canal, we will be going and taking these things over here to Pearl Harbor or all the way down here to Sydney. From the Western US, you've got San Diego, LA here. Um, these will either be going to Pearl Harbor or again, they will be going to Australia. So as you can see, we're starting to build some things here. You've got the San Francisco, let's do that, out to Pearl Harbor, um, Vancouver, Seattle, etc., out to Pearl Harbor. So from the western U.S., you know, you may even have some come from Alaska, from the western U.S., Pearl Harbor is going to be your staging base. Now for bigger tankers, uh, longer range cargo ships, and we'll get into that. Um, those are going to be, instead of going to Pearl Harbor and being dispersed down here, those are going to come this way and then to Australia. Now, why is that? Um, because when we look at the kind of the big overall picture, you're obviously very well supplied here in the United States. Pearl Harbor has a lot of supply. You are not well supplied. You're undersupplied out here in the South and Southwestern Pacific. You're undersupplied. So you're going to be bringing things from Pearl Harbor to supply all of your, ba your, your bases that you have out here. And we will be building a daisy chain from Christmas Island to Pago Pago to Suva. And you'll get to know what all these things are. Luganville, uh, Nomaya. There is a series of decent sized bases out here. And we will be moving supplies from Pearl Harbor and daisy chaining here. We will also be building a defense line here so that Japanese subs and ships cannot get to our cargo because a lot of that cargo is going to come here into Australia. Now, why is that? Because Australia has a lot of big industry down here at its southeast corner that can turn fuel into supplies, but it doesn't have a ton of supplies, especially right at the start. So all of this up here is out it is undersupplied as well. All of the Dutch East Indies, you don't have a ton of supply down through here. So we're going to be just cranking fuel and supplies into Australia and then using Australia as our launching base here to supply all of our troops that are trying to hold off the Japanese. So that's kind of the U.S. to Australia corridor. So we will, again, you know, we've talked about you've got, you know, over 500 allied bases. I can tell you that really after the first couple of turns, you're going to be focusing on San Diego, L.A., San Francisco, Vancouver and Seattle, Pearl Harbor, a few daisy chainers here to Sydney, Sydney, Brisbane, Townsville, and Darwin. So everything are, is going to be keying off those nodes, and we'll get those supply convoys going down here, and we'll get a what hopefully is a nice fence of defensive, uh, you know, aircraft carriers, ships, capital ships out here, submarines, destroyers, to, you know, keep the Japanese from coming down here and messing with our supply line. Now, once we get over into this area of the map further west, um, again, the Japanese are going to be coming down here through the Philippines. We will be pulling everything back that we can that's even, you know, that's remotely historically accurate. We're not going to be pulling Philippine, dedicated Filipino troops down to Australia. That just doesn't make any sense. MacArthur would have never let that happen. Filipino troops are going to stay and try to defend the Philippines. It's a lost cause, but they're going to try to do it. Uh, Borneo here has two big 
centers for fuel and oil being turned into fuel, Balikpapan and Tarakan. We're going to try to get all of that fuel that we can out of there. Now, <clears throat> you know, the Japanese, a big part of why they started this Pacific War in World War II was to get resources, fuel, and oil. And they needed that to keep their, their war machine running in China, you know, down through here. They wanted all of these resources of the Dutch East Indies. They are rich with resources. And we're going to try to defend them as long as we can because we want to deny those to the Japanese player. We don't want the Japanese player. Their, their big handicap is not having enough fuel, not having enough supplies to keep their big war machine running. So we're going to try to deny that to them as long as we can. And so a lot of those important places are Balikpapan, Tarakan. They're going to be coming after that. Palembang has a huge refinery. I think it's the second largest refinery in the game. You see 900 oil, 10,020 refinery. I think that's the second largest refinery after the Los Angeles refinery. So it's a, it's a massive uh, you know, resource center for the Japanese. We want to keep them from getting that as long as we can. There's actually a strategy for this game called Fortress Palembang, where uh, the allied player will just bring everything they can, can to Palembang and try to hold that as a fortress. We will not be doing that. It's not historically accurate, uh, but it goes to show you the importance of Palembang. Palembang, Oosthaven, is smaller. It's got just a level three port on a on a one suggested size, but Oosthaven and Batavia um, are very important because of this strait here. As you can imagine, you don't want the Japanese to break out here into the Indian Ocean. That could cause all kinds of problems that we'll get to in a minute. But Batavia and Suera Baja, easy for me to say, right? Suera Baja and Batavia <clears throat> are the big to uh, bases on Java. They have a lot of fuel and supply. We'll you know, keep quite a bit of that around here to try to defend these as long as we can, but we will really be pulling a lot of that back into Australia and that, you know, getting that fuel and supply there, trying to hold the line, and then eventually Australia will then push fuel and supplies up here when we try to retake all of these places. Um, so let's go back to the grand strategic map again. So we're going to be pulling what we can out of Palembang down here to Perth to Balikpapan down here to Perth. Perth is an incredibly important port. Um, and all of, you know, Singapore, we'll try to get some stuff out of Singapore, although that's harder to do because the Japanese are literally right on top of you from the start. So now you're starting to see, you know, let's draw some little nodes. Ah, we don't want that. Let's draw some little nodes of the things that we've talked about here. Uh, LA, San Diego, San Francisco. Seattle, Vancouver, Eastern U.S., Panama Canal, Pearl Harbor. Uh, you have some little daisy chains here, but really it's Sydney and Brisbane. These are the important nodes where we're going to be setting up supply lines to get as much into Australia as we can so that this fuel gets into Australia. So here's Perth. And here's Darwin. So these are kind of the important points uh, as far as supply and fuel nodes at, here at the start. Balikpapan, oh, I'm sorry, that's Palembang. Balikpapan, Tarakan. Uh, you've got Batavia, Swerbaha. Um, these are the important points on the map. So even though we have over 500 bases, and that sounds like, whoa, what in the world? Sounds like a crazy number you're really looking at the start at about 20 to 30 really important bases that will be our nodes of fuel and supplies. So let's continue on here for a second. One in, 
super important place is Cape Town. Cape Town will naturally be getting a ton, and let's click on this, we're still in Batavia. Cape Town will naturally be getting a ton of supply and a ton of fuel that, is, as I said, is naturally occurring. Now we can send task forces to Cape Town from uh, Eastern US, uh, which you can imagine, you know, New York down to Cape Town, that's, that's doable um, to enhance that. But if you did nothing, you're still going to get a lot of fuel and supply naturally happening at Cape Town, which really just models British ships coming down the west coast of Africa and coming to Cape Town. Now, Cape Town, if we look at the grand strategic map, we are going to be pumping things from Cape Town to Perth. That is maybe, you know, outside of, of the LA to Sydney, the Cape Town to Perth might be the most important convoy, convoy line you have in the game. We need to build up Australia as much as we can, and much, much of that is going to be coming from Cape Town. Now, you also have Mombasa here. Mombasa does not produce nearly as much. What it produces, we'll be sending over here to Colombo. Um, Colombo is a, a great staging ground for eventually pressuring the Japanese here. But at the start, you kind of need it to defend India. This is kind of your, your the, the main place where you're going to be defending from the Japanese pushing you know, into India and trying to get into India, which can really disrupt you as the allied player. So we're going to be sending you know, supply from and fuel from Mombasa here to Colombo. Let's I'll get off the map for a second and go look at Colombo. Colombo uh, is a is a nice little location here. It's got a size nine port. It's got a size will have a size up to seven airfield, maybe even bigger if we decide to do that. It's just kind of the big staging ground from Western India, some off map to start building a holding line here against the Japanese. That will also be happening at Rangoon. Rangoon might be the most important city for you as an allied player. Um, you need Rangoon to supply Burma and all of these British bases in Burma, but even more importantly, you need Rangoon you need to be able to push a ton of supplies and fuel into Rangoon to supply China. Your biggest challenge as an allied player is China. The Chinese have a ton of troops. They are not well trained and they are terribly supplied with both supplies and fuel. And so oftentimes the Japanese can chew them up with smaller numbers because they have better troops and they're better supplied. So we have got to try to get as much supply into China as we can. Now a little rule quirk here that I'll tell you about is called the Burma Road. It's as far as I know the only rule like this in the game. If you control a pathway, roads, railroads, whether they be minor or major, from Rangoon here to Siyung, that's called the Burma Road. It can also be from Lido, although, you know, now you're talking, I, I don't even see how that really happens, although the rule book says it can. Uh, there's not a path that I see, so it's really Rangoon to Siyung. If you control this, Siyung every day automatically gets 500 units of supply. 500 units might not sound like a whole lot when we're talking about in Colombo's got 55,000 units and 54,000 units of supply, 55,000 units of fuel. So 500 might not sound like a lot, but when it comes to China, it's so undersupplied that anything that you can get in here is great. So we are going to be just flooding Rangoon with trans or uh, with cargo ships. Uh, and some cheap tankers to try to get as much fuel and a, as much supplies into Rangoon as we can. Looking at the big map, you know, here is Rangoon. 
we're going to be bringing that from Colombo to Rangoon and Calcutta to Rangoon. Calcutta will build up very quickly and become a major source of supply and fuel based on what we're going to be doing up here on the northern part of the map. Now this is Abaddon. Abaddon has uh, just a ton of fuel. You're going to be getting massive amounts of fuel up in Abaddon. Abaddon, we're going to have tankers, cargo ships, anything that we can throw up there and get as much of that into Karachi. Karachi is the gateway to India. And the way that this game models and works, what happens is, is every bit of supply, you see these major rail lines running off of Karachi, those go all the way down here to the major uh, industrial centers, industrial centers, Delhi of India. So what we're gonna do is dump as much fuel and supplies into Karachi as we can. That will then filter out by these railway lines. You don't have to do anything. This just happens naturally. It's how the game's modeled. The more we can dump into Karachi, the more that will you know, show up in Delhi, the more that will end up showing up down here in Calcutta. So we'll just be running those convoys like mad from Abaddon and Aden into Karachi. Uh, and that's another extremely important uh, logistics node. So again, whoops, again, Abaddon to Karachi and Aden over there to Karachi. So let's go back to the major map here. So with India, there are really three, you know, are there a couple more? Yes, but really three major important ports that are going to matter here. Karachi, Bombay. Bombay gets a lot of the fuel and supplies that is created by the Indian interior here, the production centers of India. A lot of that will flow out to Bombay. So we're going to use Bombay to then um, supply and fuel more to Colombo around the corner here. You know, some of the little islands, it will help there, but also again into Rangoon. So Rangoon, we've got Calcutta, Bombay, Karachi, into Rangoon, and this is where we're going to try to supply China to the best that we can. We've also got Colombo, Cape Town, uh, and Mombasa. Not as important, Mombasa is not. So Let's get off here for a second and talk about this one again. Uh, as I said, we will be doing as many convoys between Cape Town and Perth as we can. So this is a good point to go in here and show how exactly we create a task force. In this case, it sounds like task force, so that must be, you know, capital ships, military. No, a task force, these are going to be cargo ships. They're going to be running from Cape Town to Perth and dropping off either fuel or supplies. Uh, in this case, it's going to be fuel because Cape Town only has 6901 in supply right now. Um, and it has 163,000 in fuel. So we're going to send some fuel from Cape Town over to Perth. And again, this is one of the important runs of the game. So we, we pulled up the ships at port in Cape Town. We currently only have one task force. I should back up here for a second. We have one task force already set up. This I didn't do anything. I didn't come to the game early. This was already set up by the computer historically. This is a task force carrying troops. You can see here troops, and we'll get into transports in a future episode. Transports, these APs are what you use to transport troops. You also send cargo ships, which are AK. You send those with troop transports to carry supplies. So you can see supply, fuel, troops. This is the cargo. You can see how much damage these things have. You can see what their capacity is, 3,900 units, as we think of units, and we'll get into how that equates to troops. But 
3,900 units. Down here, the AKs, the cargoes. So the Clan Alpine is a cargo ship. It can carry up to 5550 units of supply. Um, it says it's 100% full. So the second number is how fully loaded it is. 5550, it's actually carrying 5010 in supply. And it looks like it's carrying some troops too. So it looks like there was an overflow and there were a couple of squads that needed to jump on the Clan Alpine. So instead of being able to load 5550 in supply, which would be its normal load, it could only load 5010. Uh, same thing here with the fillet. The fillet, it looks like, you know, it's got the same cargo capacity, 5550. It puts some troops on here meaning it could only carry 4322 in supply. You can see that here, cargo capacity is 5550. It's filled to the brim with equipment. So I said troops, it, it's more likely that this is their equipment, but we can get into that in a future episode. Now, this task force, if we look at it again, the computer's already named it the 18th Division Reinforcement task force and we'll get into naming because it actually becomes quite important as you have all these moving pieces on the board for you to quickly be able to look at something and know where it's going what it's doing and we'll talk about that but the computer has called this the 18th division reinforcement it is going to singapore um, it's got a home port of tajilajap which we'll look at in a second it's a transport so this is all set up. This was all already done by the computer. Um, and it shows it's going to plot where it's going. So its destination, set task force destination, is Singapore. Okay, so it's coming out of Cape Town. It's sitting in the penalty box. And when it's out of the penalty box, it is going to emerge right here on the map. So all of this black border is quote unquote penalty box they call it the holding box I think in the rule book but the holding box will make that ship sit here and then it will emerge you know at the best place that it can on the map it could emerge down here for instance and it, it that just means it would have to sit in the holding box longer if it emerges there but the computer has routed this and decided that the best place for this to emerge is right here and we'll see here it comes here it comes it, it will show you when you're selected on the task force, it will show you where this task force is headed. And look, it's headed right to Singapore. Um, we saw that, so its mission is transport, its destination is Singapore. You can mess around with the routing and we will be doing that. You can change, You can. there are waypoints, you know, if you want it to go way further east and then south or if you wanted it to go south before it goes east you can set up waypoints and do that now you see here set home port to Jillet Jap uh, I'm sure I did not say that correctly but that's okay I'm not from Java uh, this is what it's set as its home port so when that transport ship comes in here it will come to Singapore it will try to dock if it can if there's enough docking space, it will unload automatically if you have it set to unload, and we'll get into that. Uh, in then probably the next episode, we'll do transports. It will unload what it can. As soon as it's done unloading, it will then come to, to, to Jillajap and it will dock if it can, but it will come into port at Tajilajap and stay there. That's its home port. Um, so that's already all set up for us. So I just thought I would show that to you because the computer set that up and thinks that's where it should go. Looking at Cape Town, we see we can see our task force here, the one task force that we've got, this transport. So we knew that one was there. We also see there are ground units here. Sure enough, that's true. Uh, and we see that there are ships at port. So let's look at these ships at port. So as I said, the AKs are your cargo ships. You can go to any port. This is, you know, across the game. And if you see AKs, it means you have cargo ships. AP means uh, transport ships for troops. KV is something called a Corvette. 
I use these for anti-submarine warfare. That's a future episode. So let's talk about what we have here with cargo. So you can you can always uh, sort these things here at the top for what you're looking for. And there are a couple of things we're looking for when we put together a cargo task force. Uh, so the type, it's, you know, we want a cargo ship, obviously. Um, and let's get rid of, so we're gonna take off all ships, so we just see the cargo ships. There we go. These are the only ships that are cargo ships. We've taken out the Corvette, and we've taken out the transport ship. Um, so this is what we're dealing with. Now what's important, when it comes to cargo, there are three things that are important, and you can see them right here. The endurance, the speed, and the capacity. That's, you know, for all of the difficulty of this game, when it comes down to cargo and cargo ships, there are three things that matter. How far they can go, how fast they can go, and how much they can carry as they're going there. So this is how I do cargo ships. Now there's a lover of the game named Cole who has done a basic setup for the allied player on turn one. He's gone through every single unit ship in the game and said, here is a very good way to set up your troops at the start, all of your units at the start. So I would direct you to that. I can link to that here at the bottom of this episode. I, when I was learning the game, I looked at that quite a bit. It will help you understand why you're doing certain things or give you ideas of, oh, that's, you know, that's why we're doing this or why we need to do that. It's very helpful. Even if you say, well, I don't want to just copy what somebody else did, it helps you learn and you will start to do different derivations and twists of what he does um, as you play the game more and understand things. When I'm looking at cargo, what I do is I try to put similar ships together. So we see we've got four ships here that are identical. They've got 16,800 uh, nautical miles of endurance before they have to refuel. They all four go at a speed of 12, and they've all got a 6,400 unit capacity for cargo. Now we are gonna be putting fuel on these, which means they've only, they're only gonna have a 3,200 unit capacity, but we've just got so much more fuel than supply at Cape Town. And as you can see, one of these ships would take almost all of the supply out of Cape Town, 6,400, 6,900. So we're gonna, we're gonna take some fuel to Australia. Uh, it just makes more sense. Now let's talk about endurance. Every hex in this game is 40 nautical miles. This is how many nautical miles this ship could go without refueling. So it's got enough fuel on board based on quote unquote endurance to go 16,800. That is a quite a bit. My, what I think of a ship that's got a lot of endurance, I kind of think of 12,000. 12,000 will get you from, let's say LA to Sydney and half the way back. So LA to Sydney, I believe is almost in the game is, and I guess in real life, 8,000 8, nautical miles. So if that just gives you kind of a, a benchmark in your head, LA to Sydney is 8,000 nautical miles. So these ships are easily, the 16,800, they're easily gonna be able to go from the southern tip of Africa, Cape Town, over to Perth. And we're actually gonna see how that works here in a minute and how you can figure that and figure out where they need to refuel. So you are going to have to be refueling these, but there are easy ways to automate that. I'll show you that. Speed, 12. So this is nautical miles per hour. Now I said 40 nautical miles is a hex. So as you can see, it's gonna be like 3.3 hours for this to move one hex. So, you know, 3.3 is about 40. It's moving at a speed of 12 per hour. So it's gonna take about three and a half hours approximately for this, uh, for one of these ships to move one hex. Now capacity, we just talked about that. 
you know, you can start to see some of the benchmarks in your head. 6,400 units. Again, that takes almost all the supply out of Cape Town. On the other hand, it's got 1,600 or 163,000 in fuel. Um, so at 3,200, this is going to be what 12,800 total. If we were doing supplies, this would be what well over 25,000. We're going to be doing fuel, so it's going to be like 12,800 of these units that we're going to move to Australia. So how do we make a task force? Let's form new task force. When you do this, it's going to give you missions, right? Now this kind of helps the a well the AI the computer when it's moving your task forces around uh, based on your orders. This is going to help it decide kind of how it reacts to things. Uh, you know, if it runs into a sub and you have a little control over this, but these missions are important because it will also, when you click on cargo here, so we've got surface combat, which is where our capital ships, you know, we'll be putting battleships uh, in that uh, fast transport, transport to move, move troops, cargo, air transport to move planes, amphibious. That is really going to be cargo or transport that we want to land where there's not a base. Uh, ASW combat, anti-submarine warfare. I will probably do a whole episode on that. It's incredibly important in this game as the allied player. Um, tankers, so when we're moving uh, fuel or oil, if we did want to move oil, you would do that in tanker task forces, support and escort. Now, depending on the one you pick, there are only certain ships that are going to be available. So this does help kind of, you know, winnow down what you can actually put in a cargo task force. Now, a cargo task force does not have to just be cargo ships. You can put anti-submarine ships in there. You could put destroyers in there that look for submarines to make sure your convoys don't get blown out of the water. You could put a battleship in there to protect your convoys. But this will show you, when we click on cargo, every single ship that we could put in a cargo task force. Now, over here, it shows you uh, auto ship selection. We'll keep that off. It just gives it a generic task force number. Um, so, you know, it'll start indexing these task force 18, 19, 20, you know, 36, whatever. Home port is going to be Cape Town. So when we create this task force, we saw that home port earlier. It's automatically going to select Cape Town. It's going to be human control. Now, I think maybe I'd mentioned that before. Oh, I did in options and preferences. We want to control you know, the vast majority of our ships. I think we talked about that when it came to submarines. You can have submarines under computer control. We're always going to have human control. Retirement allowed. Now, this is interesting. Ships, you can either set to retirement allowed or remain on station. What's the difference? Um, I kind of struggled with this when I first started playing the game. It, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But retirement allowed is is sort of like it gives the AI the computer a little more latitude what it can do so if it does run into an enemy task force per se or per se if it does run into an enemy task force it allows the retirement of your task force so if the computer looks at it and says oh that's an overwhelming force I've just got a little supply convoy here we better head back to home base. It allows um, your task forces to, to, to go back to home base, not to complete their mission, whereas remain on station is a little different. It will try to do everything it can to complete its mission, and then it will also stay where you send it until it's either out of fuel, uh, it gets damaged, whatnot. I don't use remain on station very often, so let's click on this. We've got retirement allowed, remain on station. Remain on station would really be if there's crazy warfare going out in Java or around Java and you're sending something to Singapore, let's say, and you want it to say, stay there and sit there at Singapore because returning back to its home base uh, immediately might put it in danger. Uh, you may also want it to unload something and to sit there and wait to load something else. So you would have it remain on station at its destination 
We'll get more into that in a further episode. It, it's a little more of an advanced concept, um, but it's asking you that right from the start. So you kind of just need to know a little bit what it is. Uh, auto select commander, eh, you know, on, off. For convoys, commanders don't really matter that much. Uh, you know, if you have it off, you have it on. I don't think it's really going to matter. Routing control. So this tells the computer you just want to run that thing in there normally, like the normal um, the normal path that the computer would draw. Do you want it to be safest? Meaning it will take you, you know, to far flung places to make sure it's safe. Safest, safer, direct. Direct means instead of normal, which is kind of, you know, charts out a path uh, that's maybe best to go. Direct means it's going directly there, regardless of whether it makes, you know, that much sense uh, to go that direction. It'll do it that way. Set refueling, fuel ref uh, full refuel. Generally, when you're doing convoys, you want do not refuel. This is setting refuel for when you get to your destination. So we're sending, we're going to be sending fuel to Perth. Why would we then refuel with that same fuel if we don't have to? What we'd rather do is send fuel to Perth and then have our convoy come back and then refuel back here at Cape Town, right? Um, you know, we're trying to get fuel from Cape Town to Perth. So why would we refuel at Perth? So I don't generally set these on this page. You can do a minimal refuel, which means it'll give you like a, a minimal refuel at your destination, gives you a 10% cushion over what the computer estimates it would take you to get back to your home port. So we could potentially have this on minimal refuel and it won't refuel in Perth anyway, because we'll have more than enough fuel to get back to Cape Town. But this is a 10% cushion. Tactical is a 50% cushion. So if you do need to refuel at your destination, you think you may run into trouble on the way back. You may want to do a minimal or tactical refuel. So if it has to re uh, redo its coordinates, how it's going to get back home. You don't run out of fuel, uh, you get, or a fuel, a full, <laughs> easy for me to say full fuel, uh, do not refuel. So we'll just, we'll put it on fuel, uh, full again here, just to show you what we're doing. So once we pick cargo, we're going to pick done. We're going to go up here, an easy way to do this. I just click on endurance and we'll see the four ships here. We select them just by clicking on them. So now we've got all four here. If you wanna take one out, you just click on it, it pops back up here. So as you see, you've got your arrows here. We're transfer transferring these ships down here. Now we have started to build our task force. Not only started, we have finished building it and we're going to hit done and voila, we have a task force cargo it's so this will always tell you what the mission is you can also see the mission over here our home port is Cape Town our destination is Cape Town so until you give it orders it will just keep its destination you know wherever it's sitting so that it doesn't move uh, we haven't given it orders so we don't need to worry about it routing uh, this just tells you it gave it a, a generic task force number it's got four ships, it's, it's at an off-map location. Here, we can name this. Now what I do and how, I've got a naming convention for this and I think it's very important to come up with a way that you can quickly look at this and know what it's doing at all times. So as these ships get moving out across the Indian Ocean here, you're gonna be like, uh, what's that guy doing there? You can click on it and very quickly see what it's doing. This cargo Perth that's how I name everything which is what's it doing and where is it going at all times now when this turns around and heads back to Cape Town I know Cape Town is a big supply and fuel node where I'm sending stuff out so I don't name it cargo Cape Town even though its home base is Cape Town that's what it's doing I can look at this very quickly so let's hit OK cargo Perth I can look at this very quickly and say, oh, its home port is Cape Town. It's always going to return to Cape Town. But what this uh, task force is set up to do 
is take cargo to Perth. It's just a very easy naming convention. When I do the next uh, task force, if I was doing another task force that's cargo going to Perth, I would again name it Cargo Perth. I don't give it numbers, whatever. There, there's going to be, you know, 20, 10 to 20 task forces going from Cape Town to Perth at all times. I just want to be able to click on this very quickly and be able to tell, hey, this is what its mission is all the time, cargo to Perth. Again, mission cargo. It tells you that you know, several times. You're not going to be confused. Now let's talk about speed. What does this mean? Um, one thing I am going to back up just one second. Remember when we created this task force and we had all the options over on the right hand side? Those same options appear right here, right here in the middle. So if you ever you know, I never set those on the, when we set up the task force and on that screen, when we pick the ships, I never set my preferences for the task force there. I always do it here. So human control, we talked about retirement allowed um, and remain on station. Now we're getting into speed. You can pick mission speed, cruise speed, or full speed. Generally, mission speed and cruise speed are the same thing, so we don't really need to differentiate between those two. And what does this go to? So we're coming down here, mission cargo, 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 uh, moves. This is maximum. Now, why they didn't make this an F, I'm not sure, because that equates to full speed uh, and not mission speed, <laughs> so it gets a little confusing. But when you see moves, this is maximum and cruise maximum and cruise so this shows you the number of hexes it can move each pulse as i've said before there's a night pulse and a day pulse um, that are 12 hour periods um, so every 12 hours if we were at maximum speed it's going to go three hexes if we were at cruise speed or mission speed it's going to go three hexes uh, you say, oh, so they're exactly the same? Eh, they're really not. Let's go to Clan McTavish. Uh, max speed is 12. Cruise speed is 10. So it's actually a little bit slower. So the max, but they both, in a 12-hour period, would move three hexes. So you say, well, okay, so they're the same speed then. No. And the computer will calculate this out, and at some point, one of the pulses, it'll go four hexes if it's at max speed and pull ahead of a ship that's going at cruise speed. But for cargo ships, we're always going to be going at mission um, or cruise speed unless we're going into a true danger zone. So as you'll see, once we start playing the game, when we're going into Rangoon, many times we'll do that at full speed from Calcutta or Colombo to try to get that stuff in there before the Japanese, you know, dive bombers just come in and, and swamp us. So, uh, but, you know, 98% of the time, if you're running cargo, you're going to be doing that at mission speed. So again, three hexes every 12 hours, six hexes overall. Fuel. This shows you at your current orders. So at mission speed, cruise speed, how many hexes you can go before this task force needs to refuel. Now, it's interesting because we have a task force here that have all the same stats, so it has the same endurance. So we see 420, that's how many hexes it can go. If you did the math out based on, you know, three hexes, that the fact that it's going 12 nautical miles per hour, it, it's go, it can go a maximum of 16,800 nautical miles. If you want to do the math, you can figure out that this is correct. It would go 420 hexes before it runs out of this endurance. And you will see this go down. So as task forces move, this will start to go down here. And this will also show you how many hexes um, it has left. So you can very quickly see what the fuel situation is. Now, if we turn this up to full speed, you'll see it's going to use a lot more fuel to go at full speed. Um, and so it changed this also to 12. 
uh, it would only be able to go 105 hexes at full speed. So let's go down here again, uh, 420 hexes. Current load, this shows you, you know, the capacity, the total capacity if we were doing cargo is 25,600. We've got nothing on it yet. We have no float planes. That's really only, uh, you know, certain capital ships, so cruisers and whatnot. They're not aircraft carriers, but they do have little float planes that can fly off of them, so it shows that. Shows your commander. Again, we'll get into this at another time. They don't really matter at all for cargo. Um, you see kind of the stats of it, it does have some guns, this task force. It does, and this is, all of this is... Um, combined right so this is the total for the task force we have no anti-submarine capabilities we do have some anti-aircraft here um we have no torps and we have some guns look if we stumble upon a japanese task force it's not going to matter that we have these you know small little 32 guns um, so we're human controlled retirement allowed mission speed unload cargo now you can also do not unload Okay, unload, do not unload. Obviously, we want to unload our cargo when we get to Perth. Now, all of these things, when you think about them, they're what you want this task force to do when it gets to what they call its destination hex. So when it gets to its destination, what do you want it to do? So we've already talked about refuel on the previous screen. Refuel full. We don't want that to happen at Perth. We want it to do not refuel, refuel. And when we give it its orders, you will see the total number of hexes here to the right that it will take to get there and get back. If we do not have enough to get there and get back uh, without refueling, it will turn red and we'll know that. So unload cargo, of course, when we get to Perth, we want it to unload. We do not want it to refuel and we do not want it to auto disband. What does this mean? If you turn this on, when this task force gets to Perth, it would unload its cargo, and then the task force would stop being a task force, and all four of these ships would go into anchor at Perth and sit there at anchor. So that's, if you wanna move a task force somewhere, that's kind of mismatched and you don't want it to stay together or you had to throw it together because a bunch of ships just happened to end up at the same place and you want to move them someplace else you may select auto disband when they get to their uh, destination because you want to break those up and put them in different task forces and that's what that's all about so now we're finally ready to do what we need to do with this task force now i did this on purpose uh, because Cape Town is a size 7 port. So I said, did this on purpose. And you're like, what? You haven't told us what yet. I'll tell you here in just one second. Right now, we have 88,900 tons docked at Cape Town. Why is that? Because we have that troop transport, this down here, this troop transport. But as you see, we've already got that full and filled up so what we're going to do is we're going to undock that 88,900 tons well let's dock it again so i can show you why we're doing that when you look at our task force you look over here to the right and it says cannot dock because of port size you're like well that's weird this is a big port it's a size 7 port here is what you see a size 7 port can take up to 104,000 tons because of this huge transport task force that we have docked right now, 88,900. Now this is in green showing you that you're under your limit. There's no single ship over 60,000. The entire task force is not over uh, 104,000. It's only 88,900. So you're within your limits there. The problem is while this big old elephant is docked, hardly anything else can dock. That's pretty much all that's going on at this port. So we're going to go to the transport task force. It looks like we've got all of our trip troops on here. Uh, it's up to total load of 46,993 of 47,000. Uh, you know, if there's any stragglers that, you know, haven't 
They took their shore leave. They better get here because this sucker's full. So we're going to undock this task force. Now, what does that mean when we go back over here to Cape Town? Now you see we have zero shipping docked. That's great because our task force, you're going to see, um, has 24,400 tons. So it'll always tell you that here. And we're going to dock it. So now it's docked. If we went back to Cape Town, 24,400. And that's how you kind of, you know, when you look, you can say, oh, okay, I can dock this. I can not dock this. Again, docking something makes everything happen a lot faster than if it's not docked. If it's not docked, it's just going to be, you know, but 10%, 20% is efficient, just not efficient at all. So we're now docked. And again, how the this game works, you know, it'll say undock task force meaning if you clicked on this, then it would undock it, but we're docked. Now, if some of these were out of fuel or they were very low on fuel, you could replenish the task force. So you could actually fill up your task force by hitting this replenish button. Uh, replenish task force at sea, we'll talk about that in a future episode. It basically means you have supply ships that can be floating out here or can be uh, little bases out here and they can meet your task forces and fuel them up if needed need be. That really is more of a concept that comes along with your big aircraft carrier groups or something like that. You'll have oilers that will replenish them while they're at sea so they don't have to come all the way back to base. Now you see these next three buttons, load supplies, load fuel, load troops. Uh, these are the three things, you know, that a cargo or transport could do, and here they are right here. So I said, you know, normally we want to be as efficient as possible, so we're going to try to have cargo ships always taking supplies because they can take their full capacity. Um, but in this case, given the supply and fuel situation at Cape Town, we're going to have them load fuel. So it says it will load fuel. You could cancel that if you wanted to. As each turn goes by, you'll see the total load start to build and build until it gets up to 25,600. When it gets completely full, or in if you wanted to, you can come in here manually if you wanted to get the heck out of Cape Town for some reason. You could hit cancel load fuel, undock it, and it'll take off with its orders. Uh, but as it is, we're going to let the computer control when all of that happens. We've docked it. We're loading fuel. Now we're going to set its destination. So how do we do that? Set task force destination. We're just going to click here and it opens up the whole screen. If you, you know, mistakenly click right here, it's going to set that hex as its destination. And you'll see it's just going to move here. It has nothing to do when it gets there. So, you know, obviously, oh my gosh, made a mistake. Let's set the task force destination. I always use the mini map to do this. We're gonna go right down here to Perth. We're gonna click on the base and it says task force 18 will move to Perth. Now you see it, Perth, that's great. Exit out of here. And I knew to go down here because this was confusing to me when I first started the game. I'm like, well, uh, where's this task force? It's, they've decided, or I say they, the little com men in the computer, have decided that the best place to exit the penalty box is down here. And you will see the path that it's going to take to Perth. It's going to come into Perth. What's it going to do? It's going to unload cargo because we have unload cargo selected. If we didn't want it to unload there for some reason, we would put do not unload. That would be a special circumstance. Maybe that'll come up during the tutorials, but we're gonna, for cargo, unload cargo, do not refuel at Perth, do not auto disband. It also here will tell you the hex where it's gonna exit the penalty box and enter the map if you're so inclined. Now, one thing you can do and I know this will be a tad bit controversial if anybody that plays the game a lot is watching, um, but that I like to do is once you have this set up and you know that you want this cargo task force to run back and forth and make this mission 
over and over and over again, which we may. Um, you can click off human control here, and you'll see this puts it to computer control Perth. So what, what does the CS Perth mean? Now I talked about auto convoys before. This is kind of like auto convoys, but you set them up manually. To, so I, I, they're not exactly the same thing. I set up a lot of these for what I consider safe runs. What this means is, is this task force is going to start at Cape Town, load fuel, go to Perth, unload, we're going to turn this to do not refuel. Well, I'm going to put it on minimal refuel. So it always has a 10% cushion wherever it goes. It's going to go to Perth. It's going to unload all of its fuel and it's going to return to Cape Town. It's going to dock at Cape Town, fill up fuel again, go back to Perth. It's going to do that the entire game until you tell it to stop when you've got it on CS Perth. Um, I know that some people that play the game a lot do not like to have the any anything automated i just think given the vast numbers you're dealing with here of convoys to you know go ahead and automate some of these is great this task force in game i would not automate and let me tell you why i would keep this under human control i would put this on do not refuel again the reason being is is we're doing something inefficient here we're filling up cargo with fuel. So it's only loading at half its capacity. Once we have more tankers and we can move that fuel completely efficiently with tankers, we will flip this over to carrying supplies. So I would not automate this because it's likely I may forget about it when we're able to do something um, more efficiently, which means having this run supplies is the most efficient way to use it it's just given the situation we're in here we're having it take fuel this first trip uh, one other thing i want to point out that becomes incredibly important so when you look at these uh, task forces what's it, what's its mission where is it going all of the time what's what's its true mission cargo to perth is its real mission all of the time um, the moves, given the endurance of this, it can move 420 hexes before refueling. Now, what's this? So to the right-hand side, this is telling you that to get to Perth, one part of this round-trip journey is going to take 130, it's going to go 139 hexes to get to Perth. So the distance between Cape Town and Perth is 139 hexes. The round-trip from Cape Town to Perth and Perth to Cape Town is 278 hexes. So as you can see, you do not re need to refuel at Perth. Why is that? Because you're only going 139 hexes. You have 420 hexes of capability here. So 139, you're still gonna have plenty of fuel. This may only be down, its endurance may only be down to like, let's say 10,000. It's going to then return to Cape Town. That's 278 hexes. You're still not even close to having to refuel this. Now, when it does get back to Cape Town, we will refuel it. The reason being is you never want to, you know, if it's making this journey over and over, you don't want it to get to a point where you've just miscalculated and all of a sudden it has to refuel this whole task force at Perth, which kind of defeats the whole purpose of running fuel to Perth. So anyway, these are very helpful. This is the total number of hexes it can travel before refueling. This is the round trip based on the, the mission you've given it to Perth and then back to Cape Town. This is the one-way journey. So, you know, this kind of goes to auto disband as well. If this were 419, you know, it would never be that big on this map, but 419, let's say for argument's sake, uh, you may want it to refuel or disband at Perth and make that its home port because that's a massive journey. So anyway, we have covered quite a bit today. We talked about the big logistics picture, uh, moving things from the west coast of the U.S. out to Pearl Harbor. 
from Pearl Harbor into the uh, di diaspora of little bases you have down in the South and Southwest Pacific. Um, and then also from the Western US over to Australia. We talked about pulling things out of Java and Borneo and getting those down into Australia. Uh, we talked about moving a ton of supply into Rangoon to get that dispersed out through Burma and hopefully have some of that trickle into China. Also keeping that uh, Burma road open so that China gets even more supplies. We talked about uh, Colombo and Cape Town to Perth and Cape Town to Colombo. Colombo serving Colombo and Calcutta serving as your kind of uh, supply zones to go into Rangoon. We then also talked about the off-map locations Abadan and Aden going into Karachi, your gateway to India to fuel and supply all of India. Um, when we come back next time, I think we're going to continue on with ships and how ships work. We're going to set up some more task forces, some more cargo task forces. We'll also look again at that transport task force that was down here. Um, and talk a little bit more about uh, loading up troops and how that works. Um, so hopefully this has been enlightening and made a lot of sense to you, gave you the big overview, and now, hey, look, we've set up at least one task force and looked at another. So if you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe. Uh, I would really appreciate to build this page up and to get more tutorials for maybe more games that you like and want to want to learn. Um, so thanks, as always, for tuning in, and I will talk to you next time.